So, as I think you know, I am a, sort of a dedicated AI researcher, uh, but I'm also a bit of a philosopher, I like to think. Uh, I'm an observer of human nature and human condition, as I think we all are. And um, so I appreciate this chance to, to speak to you all and to sort of share my views about, about AI and about the field and all that's happening, all the growth, all the change, all the excitement, all the hyperbole and all the, all the fear and the, the, the positive and the negative exaggeration. And, uh, you know, it's sort of hard to, to get a coherent, consistent, reliable, stable view. And I just wanted to talk about all these things today. So today I'm not going to talk about whatever appeared on the schedule. I'm going <laughs> to, I was sort of a placeholder. <laughs> uh, so then I'm going to talk about AI narratives. Narrative just means a story. And so it's this, the stories of AI, uh, what we tell each other, what we tell ourselves, and how to think about them, you know, which ones of them are accurate, which ones of them are maybe mistaken, how they may change over time, and how the future might work out. OK, but let me be clear at the outset that I'm, I'm really optimistic, and I think the future will be very, very bright. I mean, so that could be a, a utopia. Uh, nothing like that. Uh, good things and bad things will still happen, um, but mostly good things. And uh, now, AI won't even really change that. There'll still be good things and bad things. It may change which good things happen, which bad things happen. Uh, but overall, I think AI will make the world a better place. It'll make it more interesting, more prosperous, more dynamic, uh, more challenging in, in a good way. Um, okay, so. I got a gizmo. Let's start, I want to start with the root of it all, the cause. And the cause, I think, is Moore's Law, what we colloquially call Moore's Law, which is a, just the computation in, for the last, for the century, for this century and the coming years, decades, uh, Computation has become cheaper and cheaper and more and more plentiful. And this is really the story of our age. The story, this is like the age of computation. Um, and uh, so let me list this graph. Yeah, let's look at this graph. Um, on the, uh, across the bottom there, we've got years. And, and, and plotted on the y-axis is, is the computational power of computers available in that year. Okay, now notice, notice the, the, the years span over a century. They go back to the beginning of 1900. And uh, the, the y-axis is a log scale. So that means each tick up on the, on the y-axis is a, is a factor. And the, the small ticks, well, the, the small, the, the, the ticks are two orders of magnitude. So a factor of 100 for each mark there on the y-axis. And this is the amazing thing that over this period of time, over you know, roughly a, a century, uh, computer power has doubled roughly every, every two years, okay? A little bit faster recently, maybe now it's like 18 months, but it's, it's been remarkably constant and it's been remarkably consist, consistent over all that time. Like, like, can you see, for example, World War II anywhere in that graph? No, I would say not at all. There's no, not a blip because of World War II or World War, World, War, World War I or any single technological event. Um, it's amazingly consistent. Uh, over this time, it's well, over the 80, 80 or 90 years since computers were, invest, were invented, there's been an increase of 10 to the 16th. 10 to the 16th. And the 16th, that's, that's 100,000 million million, okay? It's unimaginable what can happen cumulatively over this kind of time frame when you get this consistent doubling. Okay, it just keeps happening. This is the story of our age. This is truly the age of computation. Okay, this is the root of it all, but let's think a little bit more, just a little bit more analytically. Uh, is, it, is, it, is this AI or is this computation? 
or is computation AI? How, how do we use these words? And um, I think there, these two things are confounded in our, in our minds and in our language. Lots of comp using lots of computation and being in, related to intelligence. Now, AI, AI, as a name, it has cachet. It's, it's appealing. And, and so we're drawn to it. And we want to use it. And we want to call whatever we're doing AI. So uh, I was in the drugstore the other day, and I, I was looking at electric toothbrushes. And you know what did I find? But electric toothbrushes are now AI toothbrushes. <laughs> so it goes, yeah, yeah, you can find your AI toothbrush. It says it right there at the top. <laughs> um, this is the way our language evolves. Uh, and this is not a new thing. This has always, always been true. I remember when I was in graduate school, we, had, we didn't even have computers. We didn't have our own computer. We had a terminal which connected to the big computer. And the, thing, the big thing, exciting thing, was to get an intelligent terminal. Okay, and they looked, they looked like on the last slide. What did I get? Come on. There, that's the intelligent terminal. And it was intelligent just because it could do multiple fonts, okay, and it could do a little bit of editing in the computer. Those were an intelligent uh, computer. And now, now less silly, uh, real things in our day and today, uh, we have AlphaFold. AlphaFold. AlphaFold is this amazing program from, from, from DeepMind, and where they've figured out all the proteins in the, known to man. And they figured out the three-dimensional structures from the sequences. It's really transformed biology. It's been really super important and super exciting. And it is exactly the use of computation to do something really, really hard. OK? Uh, but I would say it is. Just, it's really computation. I mean, they use neural networks, uh, in a sense they're using machine learning, but they're not, they're not like a person. They're not like an intelligent system that has a goal. Um, so, but anyway, we call that AI, and, and everyone's kind of good with that, that this, these massively complex and powerful new tools, we call them AI. And, you know, that may be a misnomer, um, but everyone's doing it, and, you know, who am I? I'm not the kind of guy who would like insist on using words differently from other people. <laughs> Thank you for that laugh. Uh, okay. So anyway, I, I, I'm going to say controversial things, but I don't want to just start with a trivial controversial thing, <laughs> like how we use the words. Let's go with the words. Let's call this AI. Um, and let's, but let's make the distinction. Let's make the distinction between uh, these two kinds of AI. Tool AI, where the, uh, we're using massive computation, we're doing something hard that, that people find hard. And, um, but but, uh, but they, these tools have to be wielded by a person. They are not autonomous. They are not complete. They are not fully powerful on themselves. They're powerful in conjunction with the person. And as opposed to agent AI, you know, if, if tool AI is creating crazy smart tools, then agent AI is creating crazy smart artificial people, new people. Um, so this, these are, now you really, you've seen my two dimensions. One dimension is tool AI versus agent AI. And, and this is how I'm going to try to add something to the conversation of how we think, what are, what's our narrative for AI. First, we're going to divide it into these two parts. And then we're going to divide it into the positive and the negative stories and exaggerations around those two parts. I think it's, it's, it's really helpful. And I think it's helpful to separate these two because we often do not. We don't, awfully do not. We lump them together, and that causes us to think in a sloppy way. So that's maybe my contribution of this talk is to separate them. So let's firm that up or make that more Explicit, you know, examples of tool AI would be like AlphaFold and large language models. They're not full agents, but they are useful, useful tools. The image generators like DALI and MidJourney. 
They don't have goals. They don't have an interaction. They don't have a life, really. They, they do things, and they're wielded by a person as tools. And on the other side, on the other side, excuse me, we have agent AI, where the, the alpha goes and the alpha zeros, all those are, are, are agent-like. Uh, deep, deep Q learning, the, the Atari players, GT Sophie, we heard about, many of us heard about the other day, the, the race cars, those are, those are agents. And even simple grid world systems can be agents. There. So, so we can make this, this distinction. Um, whether the, they have clear goals and whether they have experience, whether they have agency. I don't know if you remember, uh, many of you remember, well, like from the Alberta plan, you know, we have a picture of the agent. The agent has certain things. It has a perception. It has, it has a, a reactive policy. It has a value function. It has a model of the world. So with all those things, they're, they're not in the tools, right? The, the tools are not about, about uh, aspiring to create uh, a whole agent. Okay, so and I'm sure, I think this is a really useful distinction. Uh, maybe, maybe we can find edge cases where it's not so clear, but let's go with it. Um, and let's, so let's, let's, let's do, what we will do, spend a while doing tool AI. Tool AI, you know, it, it has a whole side, it has a positive and negative part. So it has a part that's, that's, um, that's, that's negative, that that's feels dangerous, that's threatening. Um, and, uh, but it's less threatening. You know, it's got things like fake news and deep fakes and election manipulation and loss of jobs. Loss of jobs will come from using these tools or rather changing jobs. Uh, there are all these negative things that we're familiar with. Really, we're familiar with them because they happen every time we have new technology that disrupts old jobs. And um, so, so this is, this is, this is negative, it's threatening, but at the same time, it's kind of familiar. It feels like it's not a big deal. Um, we, we've seen it happen many times before, and we, and we know, or at least always in the past, uh, there are more, more and better jobs were created to make up for the ones that are lost. Okay, but, but this, is, this, is, this is like a story that is slightly threatening uh, but is also so familiar, and so it's not—it's not super scary. It's—it's it's slightly scary. Um, you know, the scary stuff comes from the agent side. Um, now, the next thing to say is, you know, can with with this tool stuff, could we end up with agent stuff? You know, this is a story that people tell, and particularly they tell it for large language models. Large language models are getting so smart, they understand things that, that they're going to become agents, that they're going to become powerful and threatening in a way that's beyond the normal. Okay, and so I want to I wanna diss that idea a little bit, and the best way is, is uh, through humor. Okay, so I really like this cartoon. I want to show you this cartoon. Um, to th <laughs> to think this all began with letting autocomplete finish our sentences. Okay? So uh, I love this because it, it's, it has both exaggerations in it. It has the exaggeration that, oh, if we let, that autocomplete will end up being AI, will end up being agent AI, will end up being uh, powerful things that will dominate us and, and well, that, that, that could dominate and control us. And the other, and then, so that's really, um, it's really positive AI. It's an exaggeration of the abilities of large language models. Okay, that's a story that, that's around us, and and it's it's a it's an exaggeration of ne it's a negative, it's a fearing thing. It's a negative exaggeration because it's oh if we if they're able to be agents then they will they will harm us. They will control us. They will be over our overlords. Okay, so now so. This is this is a cartoon. It's not really an argument, um, but so good fun aside. You know, I, I still do tend to dismiss that the idea that we'll have a spontaneous evolution from large language models into agents, and mainly I dismiss it because I've spent so much of my life trying to make agents, and I know it doesn't happen just by chance or by by throwing in computation. You have to really organize them and structure them and and try to make them. Uh, powerful agents in order for that to happen. Uh, you know, of course, I could be wrong. Um, 
Um, now, there's another reason why I doubt it. Let me, let me just try to explain this. This is another weak argument, so, so just take it as sort of an interesting argument, and it doesn't apply just to large language, it applies to other places we might have seen. And the, and the argument is that we see a, a tendency, a psychological tendency of people thinking about complicated things to grab hold of one thing and then suggest that, well, maybe that's the, the one thing and the only important thing. Maybe I did that today. Okay, but, but I hope not. I hope I said this is a super important thing, but yeah, sure, there are other important things. Uh, but the, the tendency that we sometimes see is that people grab onto one thing and say that's, that's the only thing. So I would just give you some examples of, of this idea. I would say this was what happened with, uh, with neural networks and gradient descent. It, it was gradient descent is a powerful idea. And so many people sort of ran with it so hard and they tried to say that maybe that's all we need. Okay, and then they, leave, they would leave out, for example, I, the ideas of reinforcement learning and control they think that everything can come out from gradient descent. Or they, they think that everything, uh, other people got psyched on the idea of prediction as being a very important part of cognition. And, and I, we, I totally agree. But then they would go too far and they say, prediction is the only thing, that all cognition is just, just prediction. And so this is sort of what we're seeing with the large language models. It's been really good thing, a powerful thing. It's shown to be powerful, so many people um, want then for, for it to be the only idea, that that one idea would give everything. And I, so I think that's a tempting, common, uh, flawed way of thinking. So, and, and the large language models, the hype about large language models. And let me be clear, large language models are great. They're, they're, they're going to be extremely useful. They, they are the, um, overhyped. They are the, the premier example of of positive exaggeration of the capabilities of current AI systems, in my opinion. And I, th and I think they will dis disappoint a bit, but they will also be extremely useful. And, uh, and it's going to be good, but let's, let's be reasonable, <laughs> or try to be reasonable. Uh, so, and again, weak argument, right? I think it's an interesting argument, but it's not definitive. Let me give you, um, Another weak argument. I think these, these weak arguments help us gain perspective, think about our thoughts about the, the narratives. So another weak argument, sociological kind of argument, is that it's well known. Actually, the, it's sort of the whole phenomenon of this tremendous excitement around large language models is very familiar to AI researchers, at least old ones like myself. Uh, we would remember something called ELISA, you know, the, and you can find it in Wikipedia. Wikipedia will have, has the ELISA effect. The ELISA effect is that if there are systems that generate words and, and appears to speak to us, we will over-interpret them. Because this, this came up in the 60s, where they had simple programs that would use language. And when, when people, even smart people, physicists, scientists, interact with them, uh, they would read a lot of uh, agency and a lot of uh, understanding into the systems. It's, 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 an, it's an effect, it's, it's reasonable to cause an effect. It's well known. It's, it's, it's one, it's part, it's undoubtedly part of why large language models are so, so exciting and have such, such uh, the possibility for hyperbole. Okay, so the ELISA effect. Uh, so this is what ELISA look, looked like. Remember, it's from the 60s, and so it has a terminal kind of interface. And I wanted to read this to you all, uh, but I don't want to turn my back on you. And I can't read that monitor. It's too far away. Uh, uh, maybe I'll, uh, I can't step back. I'll lose, lose the microphone. Um, OK. Roaming one? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Okay, so this is a, a, an example of a conversation with Eliza. I'll just give you a sense of what, it, what, it, what, the, what this is or was. Eliza would, was, is pretending to be a psychologist, a psychiatrist, actually. Yeah, so Eliza would say to the person, to the human, is something troubling you? And this person said, 
men are all alike. And Eliza, what, are, what is it? What is the connection, do you suppose? And the person says, they're always bugging us about something or other. And Eliza says, can you think of a specific example? Okay, so it seems like Eliza is really understanding what's going on, but it also seems quite possible that this is a canned thing and just something that it says. When someone says, like maybe we use the word always, maybe a, a safe thing to say is, you know, can you think of a specific example? Um, yeah, you know, the, the, the human says, well, my boyfriend made me come here. And then Eliza says, is it important to you that your boy, boyfriend made you come here? You could again, is it understanding or is it just parroting back the phrase that you gave? It's a really simple program. This is 1960s. This is, this is you know, 1960s, that's 60 years. That's a million, million orders, a factor of a million, and million, million in computation. This is a tiny computer. Anyway, that's what Eliza was like. And the Eliza effect, I think, is still with us. It's easy for us to read too much intelligence and understanding into systems that talk. OK, those are my weak arguments, things, things that I think you should understand in, as context and background um, for these large language models and how, how to understand and assess their significance and what will happen with them going forward. So now let's turn to agent AI. OK, agent AI. And so here I want to remind you of a powerful truth, stepping back, a powerful truth, that a genuine understanding of intelligence would be a, a, a very big deal. Uh, for thousands of years, philosophers uh, and ordinary people alike have wondered uh, about and sought to understand human intelligence. Almost every great philosopher since Plato has, has devoted a major part of their work to the philosophy of mind. And here's some familiar memes uh, from that, philosophers and their titles. John Locke wrote an essay concerning human understanding, obviously about intelligence and mind. Uh, Immanuel Kant wrote the critique of pure reason, and of course, Rene Descartes famously said, I think, therefore I am. This is something that, that really, you know, we talk about it in AI and it's techie and it's computers, but this, this challenge, the challenge of understanding intelligence, making agent AI, is really this old, old uh, goal of all of, of uh, humanities and science. So after, these, after the philosophers, they came more like scientists. And we may recognize some of their names. And really, it's that people have always been fascinated by their inner workings. So Gustav Fechner, uh, do, studied psychophysics with Ebbinghaus, and then the psychologist and, and learning theorists, animal learning theorists like Pavlov and Thorndike, and Skinner and Tolman. And you know, a different kind of science uh, would, would be people like Jean Piaget and Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung and Timothy Leary even. Uh, they're all wondering how do our minds work and how can we make them work better? This is a grand challenge a great mystery, and our interest, in, our interest in it is not just narcissism. I mean, it is kind of narcissism, focusing on themselves and how they work, but it's, it's appropriate in the sense uh, that intelligence is a, is a great, powerful thing. I think Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, was not wrong when he said that intelligence it's the most powerful phenomenon in the universe. Most powerful phenomenon in the universe. You know, more powerful than what? Supernovas, uh, black holes. Is that crazy? Or is that right? I mean, yeah, black holes, supernova are pretty powerful, but intelligence over time 
If, if you know, the, the supernova had maybe, maybe uh, a billion years to develop, you give intelligence a billion years and see what it can do. Maybe we'll end up moving the stars around even more than the supernova. So, understanding intelligence is a, is a, is a, is a great challenge. Um, understanding intelligence, which change all of our lives in many, many ways, too many to, to even predict. To understand how to work, how, how, we, how, how intelligence works is the holy grail of science and philosophy. Uh, to achieve such an understanding would be perhaps the greatest uh, scientific achievement of any age. I guess I have a slide on this. It's, um, and I guess I have a, a sort of a quiz to help us get started. Um, so could AI be such a powerful phenomenon? I guess I've already told you that I would say yes. It could be as powerful, the most powerful phenomenon in the universe. It's, some, it's, it, it's almost plausible. But then I want you to ask, well, can tool AI be such a powerful phenomenon? Can, and I would say no. I would say the, the powerful phenomenon is the, the people that are wielding the tools. And the tools themselves are not a powerful, uh, are not powerful. And so here's the slide. This is actually a slide from, from my talk a year ago where I was trying to make this point that, that, that it's such a, a, a long-standing uh, goal of mankind to understand how we think and, and, and improve ourselves and um, so far as to use technology to create new beings or to become new beings that are as, as intelligent and, and powerful. As we then as we are now, so um, notice, you know, it's being driven still by Moore's law. Um, it's happening roughly now. Uh, pursuing the prize is, is 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 a great and glorious thing to do. A shot at the prize is much more important than personal fortune or a contribution to the economy. Even the economy, all the world's economy, is small compared to this kind of transition in the status of the world, um, the planet, uh, this portion of the universe, you know, how, how would we not want to be part of it? So I'm giving you the positive story for why it's exciting and why this is something we, we have to do, why it's the natural next step. But I really want to phrase the question for you and not just, not just present my point of view. So this, what is this key question? Uh, the key question basically, is it good? Is it good? Um, and as I dwelled on last year, uh, often we don't get to choose these things, but we can still evaluate them. We can still say whether it's good or bad. And that's a very important part of the story or the narrative that we tell. So let's focus on just that question. Um, uh, is creating new people, new people that are smarter than we are now, is this a grand and glorious prize, natural next step in the human quest, you know, or is it a nightmare uh, bringing to the end of all we know and love? So, you know, basically, would it be good or be bad or bad? And I just want you all to recognize that it's it's hard to assess such a thing. It's a, it's sort of very personal. It's very subjective, and I don't want to. I don't, I don't really want to answer it today. I want to phrase the question, make it prominent on your, your board of things that are happening in the, in the world of AI, and um, think about it. So you can tell I, I'm on the grand and glorious side. Um, and others I want to recognize would say, oh, look, that Richard, uh, he's a uh, AI scientist. He's, he's lusting for the prize of the fame of the glory uh, that, that he is so explicitly stating. Um, and I would say to those other people, they're just fearing change. They're fearing they would lose control of the world, a control that they really don't even have now. They're, they're fearing um, uh, they're talking themselves in an unwarranted fear, and it's sort of messianic because uh, if you think you're going to save the world, you may do things that 
that are drastic and, and evil. So, so these are our, uh, our narratives, the fearful narrative, and the, uh, yeah, so the fear, the fear monger narrative, I think, I'm sad to say, I think it's, it's winning a bit. I think it's the standard, I think everyone knows, oh, AI, danger, potential dangers. A bunch of potential good things, but we all know it's potential dangers. Okay, so the first thing I'm trying to, sophistication I'm trying to add to that is to separate the tool AI, the agent AI. I'm not trying to say the agent AI isn't dangerous. Maybe it's, it's the thing that is potentially more dangerous. But I am trying to say, right now we have one narrative for the agent AI, and that, that's that it's dangerous. We have to control it. We have to keep it from getting out of control. And, and so we should have another narrative. Oh, yeah. So, um, so one, way to, one way to see this is look at the standard narrative. The standard, in, in the, the field of AI, a, a, a recognized standard thing to do is to solve the control problem. The control problem is how do you control the AIs? You know, it's, it's not like a slaveholder saying, how do you control your slaves? They, they're getting more intelligent, they're figuring stuff out. How do I make sure that they're never out of control? And um, the standard field doesn't ask, you know, if that slave, slave and slaveholder point of view is appropriate. It doesn't ask if, if people would use their slaves against each other. If you have a few, uh, and thus that would be a problem. It doesn't ask, um, yeah, whether this is moral. Okay, so. Also consider that the AI safety point of view tries to solve the alignment problem, which is seizing control of all the agents in the world and ensuring that, they're all, uh, that their goals are aligned with those of people. And it doesn't ask you know, which people, because people do have different goals. And it doesn't ask you know, how is that going to be enforced and how, what kind of a world you'd have if no one can make uh, an AI that wasn't, that wasn't approved by, by something. Who would, who would do that? Um, and then, wouldn't this kind of freeze things in place? How could, how could our, our, our values evolve? Because our values are not perfect. The world of, of people uh, has many flaws, and we need it to be challenged and to continue to evolve. So the fact that we don't ask these kind of difficult questions, this, this, is, what, this is my evidence, really, that the fear-monger narrative is winning because we just, we just stop at... at, at, at thinking we have to control it, we have to align it, and we don't go on to see the, the obvious uh, challenges to that way of thinking. Okay, so I'm gonna reflect a little bit more. Uh, good. Um, so where does this fear come from? Why are we so fearful? Why are we kind of viscerally fearful of, of the potential of the strong AI? agent AI. And I think it's really in our DNA. It's in our, it's in our instinctual history. So I call it the, it's the fear of the other tribe. So, uh, you know, many times in humankind's history, um, we've, different people haven't come in contact with each other. And sometimes it's peaceful, there's trade, intermarriage, Sometimes it's violent. I would say more often it's violent, different, different, really genuinely different people. Uh, and one group or the other dominates, dominates and kills and slaves. This, this is in our genetic history, both as the dominator and the dominated. Uh, these attitudes, are, these, these are still part of our attitudes towards others. Um, you know, I, I think now, particularly in Canada, we try to be more open-minded and, and embrace the differences, um, and what's different and good in others. Uh, we try to be welcoming and not fearful. But yeah, the, the fear monger narrative of AI, it builds on our instinctual fear of the other tribe, the other people that are strong. Uh, and, and so we know from our human history that it, it's their major advantages if we can overcome that and work together and collaborate. Okay, so. 
now I want to paint a picture, a more positive picture, to sort of counterbalance the fearful narrative. So the, pause, the hopeful picture is that the AIs are not alien things to be controlled, but they're our allies and our offspring. They are of us rather than against us. And as such, we don't uh, try to control them tightly out of fear, uh, but rather we appreciate the differences, we uh, work with them, and we, we try to align our society so that we all um, see it as beneficial to work together. Including, and we include the possibility that they might uh, teach us something fundamental, just as we, ask, we expect that our children, as they grow up, might teach us something fundamental. And we don't just train our children, we also learn from them. And so we don't ask, in the, in the hopeful narrative, we don't ask, how can we control the AI's goals, but we rather ask, how can we arrange society so that they will want to work together even though there are different goals. Notice that this is already how we do it with people. With people, uh, people have many different goals. You know, sometimes we say, oh, human, go human values. But really, everyone has different goals, right? We, we, your food is not my food. We have different stomachs. We have different uh, families and different bank accounts. So it's really not that our goals are the same. It's that it's our goals, in some sense, are symmetric. But they are, in, in a real sense, opposed. And it's only because we've arranged society so that we don't, that the outcome is good. So now, some of you know, may know about reinforcement. Reinforcement learning, we have a direct map of this. So every agent has its own reward signal. Those are its goals. They would be like its food um, and its, 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 its pain. Um, and agents can have, would have normally different rewards, okay? But their values, the values are predictions of reward. And the, the things, the technical term value in reinforcement learning, it means, again, prediction of, of reward. And in many, in, in, a, in, a, in a hopeful narrative, the, um, the values become aligned. Like, so even though I might want my food, I would recognize, I would also like a, a principle that says, uh, we respect each other's property, and we don't try to beat each other up or take things from each other. And this is really the way our world works. Our world works by we've set up laws and, and mores so that we produce a certain, so that a certain kind of behavior is rational. Every, everyone gets their most, the most reward by behaving appropriately and leaving space for others. Okay. Um, another point to be aware of, it's in, it's in the fearful narrative, which is, um, you know, is there one AI or is there many? The most obvious fearful narrative is that they will become one super AI which will quickly become much more powerful than everything than all the people and all the other AIs and take over and then we'll have a singleton, a singleton, a single agent that controls our world. Um, so this relies on the idea that it's, that it's fast. If, it's, if, it's not, if the takeoff is, is not fast, then we, it's, it's more, it makes sense that there would be, um, yeah, so I mean, to connect it to the last bit, we, we can't have peace if there's one strong man that that's, can, can dominate everyone else. It's because no one is totally in control. Everyone has to share power. That's how you get peace, and that's how you get aligned values in human societies. And the same would be true uh, amongst AIs. And I can't avoid, I can't, I can't resist mentioning the idea of the complex adaptive system. My view is that the world is not something that's in control. It's something that, that is, is a complex adaptive system. It's decentralized, many, many parts. They have to share power with each other. And this is where it gets much of its robustness and its ability to, to, to shift and be, be dynamic, to change, to go one way or another, to find the way of being which is most successful in the universe. Um, so I think if we think let's, the, part of the hopeful narrative is to view the world as a complex adaptive system be very difficult to take it over, and those who, who might try would actually end up poorly, and therefore it will be irrational to try, 
and a, a, a super intelligent, rational agent will, will not, will be seeking to work uh, with us and with the other AIs rather than trying to take over. Okay, well, I think that's, that's about all I really want to offer. Um, let's recognize that people's attitudes towards these questions will not change uh, very rapidly. It's enough just to bring up the questions, uh, to, to realize that there is a standard narrative, maybe it's not, maybe, and, and it's not the only narrative, it may be leading us to a bad place. I urge each of you not to rush to join or to assume or to adopt uh, or to, to assume it's, 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 it's natural and inevitable that there will be this fearful nar narrative. So to summarize about the stories of AI, there's two dimensions. Well, first, it's this is the century of computation, and then there are, there are two driven by Moore's law, and the two dimensions of tool AI and agent AI, each one has positive and negative hype. Um, each one has a, a risk-reward profile. The risk-reward prof profile of tool AI is, is sort of familiar and manageable, and it's often conflated with the risk-reward profile of agent AI, which is of a higher variance. Um, so which narrative pre prevails, which, which meme becomes popular, I think is really important for the story of AI ultimately. And uh, yeah, so, and who, who sets us up? Well, we do, you all do. Uh, we set the narratives, we spread the memes. It's something we should feel responsible for. And really, this, this is a really important part of the story of AI, the final story of AI. Okay. One more thing. <laughs> One more thing, which is I want to tell you about my personal story. Um, as you know, the Edmonton office of DeepMind, where I worked for many years, it was closed down this January, and that was a blow. I think it was worse, worse actually for DeepMind than it was for the Albertans like myself. All of us have gone on to other excellent opportunities, mostly still in Edmonton. There are new startups. Some have gone back to the university. A large contingent has joined uh, Sony AI, which Peter Stone told us about yesterday, in Sony AI in Edmonton. And, and the Sony AI in Edmonton is, 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 is the the largest piece of Sony AI in the world, and arguably it's, it's, it may be now the, the, the uh, biggest AI reinforcement learning research effort in the world. So, but today, today I want to announce my own plans, even though they're preliminary. So, I want to announce uh, something we call Open Mind Research. Open Mind Research it's a nonprofit organization dedicated, focused on implementing, executing, developing the Alberta plan for AI research that I told some of you about yesterday and, or on Wednesday and that that's, uh, has written up. Anyway, that's our clear focused research plan. Um, open, oh, so, yeah. It's a network, and I will be staying in Edmonton to, to develop it. And I hope you will clap for that. <laughs> also in Open Mind Research is Joseph Modile. And Melanie Marvin, I think Joseph is here. Yeah, good. It's it's an it's an interesting world and in how to structure ourselves within it. Whether to make a, a startup company and, and try to make you know an infinite amount of money from the rise of AI, uh, but we think it's more important to uh, work on the the research. So we're structuring the. Um, the organization as a 
as a network of researchers. We're going to be funded by donors. Uh, we will not have intellectual property. We'll be totally open. Our main adjectives are open, focused, and lean. Uh, we want something that will be able to last a while so we can figure out the key things and, and, and bring AI forward over the next decade. So open mind research will be a foundation supported by donors. And we are now looking for, for donors, uh, particularly two donors and one we'd like to be from Alberta. You know, if, you're, if you know of anyone or if you might be interested in yourself, please ask them to contact me. And I am just really excited to be uh, laser focused on the prize of, of achieving Agent AI as, <laughs> as suggested here. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to, I, I'm excited actually to, to get questions or comments on the, the narratives of AI. So Just raise have, your hand and you'll get a mic. Oh yeah, so you raise, raise your hand and the mic will come to you. Hey, Rich. Um, fantastic talk, and uh, thanks for the shout outs. Thanks, Peter. Uh, um, so I completely agree with you that there's these two uh, potential focuses, foci, I suppose, for um, the, the AI narrative. And the AI agent one, um, is sort of captures the imagination, um, but some would argue is you know is still far in the future, and we don't yet know what it will look like. The AI tool one is clearly here, um, and you seem to say just don't worry about it; it'll be fine, and be <laughs> because it because it you know because it always has been. And I I agree with you. I'm I'm on you know the your side here. Um, I, I think AI tools will make the world a better place. Um, let me but, pause but, you. But it seems let me, me pause you. Yes. Just, and just, you keep going. But let me just uh, thank you for saying that because I really don't want that to be the message. The, they, both are really important and exciting. And and you know, large language models, tool AI, AlphaFold. These are all great things. They have transformed biology, they've, they've transformed, uh, you know, uh, writing and programming. And I don't, I don't really want to say in any way that they're, they're bad. They're all good. Just a little bit hyped and, and, and they may disappoint. And, and the, I don't really, really that to, I don't want that to be a negative thing. I want, let's acknowledge that they're, they're probably going to disappoint a little bit because there being so much is being claimed for them. And let's not let the, the, the disappointment that happens kill them. I mean, it's not going to kill AlphaFold. And it shouldn't kill large language models either. These are great things. They're a great part of the, the broad community of AI. Uh, and all, and yeah, I, I am interested, more interested in one, that, but that's fine. That's just, they're both great. They really are. I really believe that. So, so I hear you saying that, and that's what I thought you were saying too. I, I think you, you know, I, I guess my comment is more the, and maybe you've just answered the way you would want to answer what I'm asking. But um, it seems like you know, I, I'm asking for your help um, answering the questions of people who are saying, "Oh, it's these AI tools that are going to be bad." Some would say that you know you were sort of glib in your dismissal of that as it's oh it's going to be like it was in the past and I get that people say that to me oh well, you can't you know I say oh it's usually been good you know most technologies have good and bad they've generally been on the on the good side but you know then people push back maybe this time is going to be different do you have like sort of you know can you help us construct deeper arguments against those the naysayers who are naysayers because of the AI tools so very very good. Um, the, key th the key here, is I intend to, to be answered by the separation into tool AI and agent AI. Uh, I think tool AI, it will, it really will be um, a, as challenging in, as in the past and, and no more. It, this time it will not be different as far as tool AI. But the part where it's, it's realistic to say this time it will be different is when we talk about agent AI. It's when we're really talking about replacing people 
and uh, capturing the capabilities of people. It's, it's on the agent AI that, that, that things may be different. Yeah. So to push just a little back, so, so the Model T car was, yeah. was invented in 1908, and it took 50 years, roughly, yeah. to get to 100 million cars in the world. Yeah. And during that time, we figured out things like seat yeah. belts and, and airbags and traffic signals yeah. and highway networks and insurance and regulation and all yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah. ChatGPT got to 100 million users in one month. And there wasn't that time. So how is, how is it that this is, you know, what, why, why should we say it's just going to be the same? It's, it seems faster and possibly, I mean, I'm, I'm being devil's advocate here a little bit, but, but it seems possibly different. Why, why, are, why can you just say, how can you be confident that it's not different this time? It's a bit broad brush. Um, and it is, like, super important. You know, it's, but it's, it's uh, the, the, uh, the other, the agent AI is, is even more important. I mean, it goes back thousands, millions of years uh, into our history and our intellectual traditions. Um, yeah. To me, it's, it's a qualitative difference. And so I don't, uh, it's, it's not to dismiss it. It's not to say an enormous amount needs to be done. It, yeah, I just don't see why it's going to be different. If, for if you, as long as you stay on the tool side, people are still in control. People are still wielding the tools. That's that's and that's the normal technological change and disruption. Okay, we'll let someone else. Thank you for your great talk. Uh, my question is about the government. I know most of the fear that we have comes from government because it fears that it's going to lose the power and the central power uh, of the state. So do you agree that if we compare the AI for atomic bomb, I, know, I don't know if you agree with that or not, uh, do you agree that we should have a government-based uh, organization to control the AI or not? And the second question is about the research. Uh, for a young research like me, do you, uh, what is the best path do you think for us to focus on based on the, the, the agent AI? Thank you. Well, the latter part, of course, you know, I've got the Alberta plan. It lays out a research plan. Uh, but I really, I'm glad you brought up the issue of government and and, and, you know, because I think the fear mongers are, are, are trying to gain control. Like, it, it's a usual strategy of all, not only governments, but particularly of governments, to create fear and then to use it to grab control. And I think, and so, if we are, people are scared enough, they will look for safety and they will hand the power to something. And I think this is exactly the opposite of what we want to do. We do not want a centralized place that has the power and if we are worried about AI, we say we got to regulate it. Maybe, may, maybe they can only have certain goals. The government is going to control those goals. This is exactly the opposite you want. You've centralized the, uh, the power, and it will make it easier for it to be seized uh, and to uh, have the bad outcome. This is the opposite. This is why, there's one reason why it's important to have a counter to the, the negative, fearful narrative, is because it might drive us. It is dry. You, know, you see it every day. Saw it in the congressional hearings recently uh, with, with uh, op OpenAI. Uh, there is a strong push to give more power to centralized organizations. This is, if we want to have a the world to be a complex adaptive system where it's robust and fluid because no one is control. And let me just say, th I think it's clear that is the situation now. There is no one really in control. There's no, there, there are many countries, first of all, and even the individual countries, they don't have total control. They have to trade off the powers, and they have to trade off to the power to the, to the, uh, to, to the economy. It's, it's a complex adaptive system. And this is what I hope will save us, and that we want to resist the, the call of those who are fe fear fearful to centralize power in particular institutions. Uh, 
Uh, hi, Rich. Uh, the, my name is Prashant. I come from the industry, so I'm not an AI researcher by any means, but a very intriguing talk. So I have a more of a philosophical question on your idea around agent AI and the fact of superior intelligence somewhere down in the future, more intelligent than us as human beings. So my question more is, does that really mean fundamentally that we as intelligent beings can conceive something more intelligent than us when we have yet to see the limits of our own intelligence. I mean, you're, you're building something, assuming it could be more intelligent than you, when we have yet to understand our own mind as human beings and as what we're doing with the universe. So just curious, right? A, a system trying to ascertain or create its own copy when itself it doesn't understand what who, who or he, uh, what he is. So just curious about that. Well, my own thought is that the path to creating superior intelligence runs through understanding our own intelligence, at least major parts of it, much more than we know understand now. And I should say, I, I, I try to be always careful that we say our, our goal is to create beings that are smarter than us. So I always say our goal is to create or become beings that are smarter than we are now. I, I do think there's a very good chance that the, the focus will be on, on making ourselves smarter and you know, more capable using, not only using, but not only using the tools. Uh, yeah, we, it's, it's one problem to understand the mind, to understand ourselves. Yeah, I might be wrong. Maybe, maybe we'll find a way to just make, <laughs> Make AI with AI without understanding it. Uh, I like the, you remember you remember the, the the classic quote from Richard Feynman. Um, that which I cannot create, I don't understand. So, so creation is required. But the other way is, is also interesting. You know, can I create it without understanding it? Um, in some sense, we do, right? We make children, okay? We don't, <laughs> we don't understand how, that, how, that, how they work, but we can make them. We, can have, we have a Xerox machine, too. We can make pictures uh, without understanding how they're created. We can, and I guess we can do it now with, 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 uh, with AI. Um, cool. Any other thoughts? Uh, with your, uh, thanks again for your awesome talk and you. your information. With your open mind uh, venture, it appears that you prefer an open source idea. Yeah. Would you prefer a fully open source regulation system for AI instead? Like where everybody combines in a, I don't know, like a World Economic Fund or a WHO, and instead have a WAIO? <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I really am against centralized organizations. I'm against the World Economic Forum and all those other ones, so I wouldn't want to create another one. But I, I, like, <laughs> <laughs> I like sharing, I like being open, uh, I like open source. I, I think it's essential if you're going to do fundamental research that, that will impact over a large, longer period of time, over five years even. Um, you, have to, uh, you, you have to share your ideas just to, be, uh, to, to shape your ideas, to make your ideas better. You've got to have them be challenged by others. You can't keep them secret. You, you have to publish. I think it's a bit of a problem that, that the... The uh, corporations are becoming a bit more closed and less likely to publish now. Um, and uh, intellectual property, uh, without having, to, having a real, I, I won't claim deep understanding, but I will claim, I, will, I, have, a, I have a strong reaction that intellectual property is always a, a waste of time and always a counterproductive. It's costful, it slows things down, and it doesn't really, uh, protect in a good way. So I'm against, I'm not interested in having intellectual property at all. Thank you for your question. Hi, uh, at the back. 
Yeah, I really appreciate you tying human behavior and evolution to this process because as a tool, but, but man still controls the lever on that and our human behavior, you know, will, will drive us in different directions. Um, but uh, I think Hobbes, father of political science said, you know, man moves towards convenience. So we move out of the field into a cave, wrap some fur around you, start a fire and then get people to work for you. Right, so where does that leave us, you know, if we have the tools to do all of the things that need to get done? Well, the, the fur and the cave, those are the early tools. We've always made tools, and the tool AI is a natural continuation of that. Yeah, and the agent AI is a natural continuation of our trying to understand ourselves more deeply and, and being open to change. I think it's, it's consistent. Yeah, it's, you know, I, I want you to feel both things. I want you to feel, feel that AI is, is bringing ch dramatic change, and it, at the same time, it's continuing trends and forces that have been uh, present uh, forever. It's, it's a natural next step. Thank you for that question. Cut it off there. <laughs>